Good afternoon to everyone. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> Welcome and thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Beatriz Junco Gonzalez. I manage corporate communications and corporate social responsibility at Amarant. And uh, we're the proud sponsors of the uh, Center for Leadership Lectures, the Leadership Lectures, which um, began in 2011. It's hard to believe that um, it's been, what, nine years. Uh, and we, um, we're, we're still uh, putting together this program with the staff at the center, who is, which is amazing, uh, and bringing these uh, speakers to you. Uh, we've had about 37 distinguished speakers, I'm, I'm told. And I was looking earlier at what's rotating up here in terms of all the different speakers we've had along this journey, and it, I, am, I am absolutely dumbfounded. It's, 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 it's amazing the kind of, of, of uh, uh, speakers and the profile of everyone in different ranges, different backgrounds, just amazing the level of, um, of speakers that we've had. So I'm very proud of that as well. Uh, I would like to um, now keep it short and sweet. <laughs> I would like to call up to the stage uh, Nathan Hiller, who is director of the Center for Leadership at Florida International University, to say a few words. Thank you. Good afternoon. Great to see such smiling, bright faces here today. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Betty. I just want to give another round of applause to thank Amarant for their fantastic sponsorship over the years. We, we feel incredibly privileged to have had such a uh, reliable sponsor and, and such great people as well. Uh, to work with, and so we're just we're just really uh, feel blessed that that we have this opportunity to work with them, and we're also feel incredibly fortunate that we have the opportunity to gather all of you here, that you show up, and that we also have these fantastic speakers who come to share some of their insights and ideas uh, with you today. And I will introduce Kaihan here in just a moment. Let me ask just before we get started, how how many? I think there's a few of you. Kaihan used to live in Miami, and he might, I don't know if he's going to be talking about this. How many of you have interacted with Kaihan before in one form or another uh, before? I think there's a few of you here. I know there's a few people who are coming, came off campus. I know there's at least one of his former students here. Um, Kaihan has, uh, is a world-renowned uh, speaker, consultant, and thought leader. That word gets thrown around a lot. Uh, helping organizations think through, as well as individuals think through, how they can be innovative regardless of the type of organization that they're in. He has all the credentials you could ask for uh, and, and has a doctorate degree as well, has worked at uh, various prestigious organizations and for the last number of years has really been running uh, and, has, and has been uh, working on his own and he's the author of numerous books and really a world-class guy. The great thing about Kaihan is, uh, one of the, other, one of the great, other great things about Kaihan is that he is just a great guy. So in addition to being all around, I'm gonna use a technical term, badass, he's just a great guy. His, uh, his affiliation with FIU goes back, he, he actually was in some of the original conversations where the Center for Leadership was just an idea. So there was a group of people around a table, and Kaihan actually had been brought in to help think w through what the Center for Leadership is. He is an adjunct faculty member and teaches entrepreneurship in the College of Business in the online program. So if any of you are in that program, you might want to look for his course. Or if you really think, man, this guy was boring, maybe you don't want to take his course. But I know that won't be the case. So. So officially, Kaihan is committed to helping organizations and individuals thrive in today's era of fast-paced, disruptive technological change. Kaihan is known for his ability to turn difficult concepts into easy-to-understand ideas that drive meaningful outcomes and actions. He is an internationally recognized thought leader, battle-tested consultant, and sought-after keynote speaker on the topics of business strategy, growth, transformation, and innovation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kaihan Krippendorf. Thank you. 
Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah, it's great to be here. As, as Nathan said, it was, uh, I think it was 2004 or so that I uh, first started getting involved in FIU. Um, at the time, I was working at a consulting firm in the Miami office called McKinsey, and I had published my first book. And I remember, because that's sort of where what I get to do now began, I remember talking to this manager that was uh, my manager at McKinsey, um, Trinidadian guy, really nice, uh, and my, my, my family's Jamaican partially, and so we kind of connected on that level. And I remember taking this book to him and saying, hey, I wrote this book, I would love to find a way to somehow incorporate this in the work that I do here at the firm. And um, I remember him saying, uh, look man, <laughs> do you know I love your passion, but you're gonna have to do that on your own time. You got your nights after 10 o'clock, you got your weekends, and so I quit. A lot of people quit, right? And this kind of makes sense that if you want to change the world, if you want to impact and do what you want to do, that you've got to quit your job. If we look at the people that we really admire as innovators today, if we look at the most innovative lists of business leaders, you'll notice several things that are susceptibly in common. One is that they all are white men, <laughs> which is a major problem that we have to address, we're not gonna talk a lot about here, but I'd like you to look at their narratives. They follow a very similar narrative. Sometime around college, they get an idea. And then they either quit college or they finish, and then they take the journey across the country to the West Coast. With this idea, they put together a small team. You got the hipster, you got the hacker, you got the hustler. And they step into the cave, the garage. This is the HP garage where Hewlett and Packard invented, you know, what they invented. Then they take it out of the garage and they leash it out on the world and they disrupt the big guys. So it kind of made sense to me that if I really wanted to do what I wanted to do, I would have to quit. So I started this firm. Uh, I started teaching entrepreneurship at FIU, I still do today. And we would go to companies with the techniques in this book and we'd say, we can help you think disruptively and think innovatively. And actually, we're kind of, kind of successful. Usually when we sit a group down together because we are able to apply a certain technique that is about patterns rather than logic, which we'll get into later. That's how humans create innovative ideas. We could get people to come up with these beautiful ideas. But so often, when the idea was created inside an established organization, it would go nowhere. Right? It would hit the bureaucracy, the hierarchy, the culture that kills and suppresses innovative ideas inside established companies. And there's a lot of agreement for this fact. This is Clayton Christensen. He's the Harvard professor that coined the term disruptive innovation. How many people have heard the term disruptive innovation? So this is his term. And he argued that the very decision-making and resource allocation processes of established companies are the very same processes that kill disruptive technologies. People talk about corporate antibodies. You introduce a new idea inside an established company and corporate antibodies emerge to suppress the idea. Which is why entrepreneurs are innovators. Over 70,000 books on entrepreneurship. 150 on employee-driven innovation. That's why there's so many programs that teach entrepreneurship. Over 2,000 top entrepreneurship programs in colleges. Maybe seven on entrepreneurship. So I was kind of going around and doing this work. Sometimes the ideas would go somewhere, and we do think that the ideas that came out of our work have generated over $2.5 billion in new annual revenue for clients, but usually they fail. So about five years ago, I was driving, I lived in Greenwich, Connecticut, outside of New York, and I was driving into the city, and I heard a radio program, and I, it was about a story of a woman named Jean, Jean Fawall. And she worked at a big publishing house called Macmillan, and she came up with an idea that then she developed, and it turned into, um, you know, we can talk about exactly what it was later, but think of it as a, a really innovative, crowdfunded platform for sourcing would-be self-published authors, and they publish these works before they are actually done, and they interact with a community of readers. And this was rated on CNN and PBS and NBC as one of the most innovative 
uh, ideas in publishing, and it occurred, and what I recognized was this was an idea that I'd heard before. That three years earlier, I was in a workshop, and she came up with this idea, and I expected it would go nowhere. But it actually, it turned into something. So if my question up until that point was, where do great ideas come from, my question then became, where do great ideas go? And I wanted to see, is this an exception to the rule? Because we all talk about entrepreneurs. And I love entrepreneurs. I'm an entrepreneur. I teach entrepreneurship. But I want to see, what is the truth? So I looked at the 30 most transformative innovations over the last 30 years as judged by a panel of professors based off of 2,000 submissions. These are the big ones. This is email, the internet. DNA sequencing, MRIs, and I said, who conceived of this idea? Was it an entrepreneur or was it an employee? How many people would say that more than 50% of these innovations were conceived of by entrepreneurs? Would your gut tell you that? I thought it was going to be 80%. But actually what I found is that 70% of these innovations were conceived of by employees. On the right-hand side, we have who conceived of the idea, in the middle, who developed the idea, in the garage, metaphorically, and then who then launched and scaled the idea. And if you just look at the left column, we could go into this, and there are lots of interesting conclusions we can draw from it, but the red are innovations that were conceived of by employees, 70%. If it were not possible for you, working inside an established company or an organization, to conceive of and launch an idea, if that were not possible, you would not wake up in the morning and have a mobile phone to reach for? You couldn't connect it to the internet. You wouldn't be able to send an email. If you got sick, you couldn't get an MRI. You couldn't get a stent. We would live in a dramatically inferior world if it were not for employee innovators. So I think it's really important that we start understanding the path of employee innovators. Whether you are a leader, your future growth, your next billion dollar company is gonna, gonna come from an employee. If you're going to school and you're going to graduate, you're going to go somewhere, and you're thinking, do I need to start a job in order to do what I want, to have an impact, to make a difference, to change the world? I'm telling you, it's not, it's not substantiated by statistics. Actually, employees are great innovators. So I started interviewing employee innovators. I've interviewed about 150 of them and asking them what their challenges were and what their paths were. And so I just want to share a little bit of what I learned, introduce you to a framework, and then I'm going to ask you which parts of the framework you'd like to dive into, because I have too many slides and too much to share with you in the time that we have. Um, we're gonna kind of customize this a little bit and go into what is most valuable for you. Sound good? Great. So, first thing is that you find is that the, the, the journey of an employee innovator is different than that of an entrepreneur in four very important ways. One is you have two jobs, not one. It's unlikely that when you come up with an idea, your boss is going to let you quit your work or even give you 20% of the time. Or if they give you 20% of the time, that's probably out of 120%. Right? It's going to be you're out of high time. So that's one thing we got to get heads around. The second thing is you have one investor, not 40. As an entrepreneur, on average, you visit 40 different investors with your idea to find the right match between your employee and the idea. But as an employee, you have one investor, your, whoever you work for. And so you need to come up with 40 ideas to find the right match. So it's kind of the opposite challenge. The third is it's a relay race, not a sprint. One of the reasons I found difficulty finding these employee innovators is that by the time the idea gets launched into the market, you forget who started it. Someone took the baton and passed it to someone else and passed it to someone else and passed it to someone else. And the last one is that you can launch slowly. It takes a long time to launch, but once you launch, you can scale rapidly because you have many offices, you have many employees, you have channels, you have partners. It's sort of like one guy explained it to me. It's like aligning up the cannons. It takes a long time to line up the cannons, but once you do that, they go off with a big bang. Whereas the entrepreneur kind of has the opposite challenge. It's you launch quickly, but then scaling becomes a challenge. So these four things make internal driven on innovation different from that of an entrepreneur. So what are the costs of talking about employee? I'm not talking about employee, but talking about entrepreneurial innovation. Um, I believe that the stories you tell and the stories you, tell, you hear tell you what's possible. You know, my wife's a Hispanic woman, grew up in the South in Louisiana. She's now a very senior executive at MasterCard. 
But it was a bit of a struggle for her because she didn't hear any stories about women making it to general counsel. She didn't hear any stories about Latinas making it. And now she spends a lot of her time working on telling those stories. What you hear, you know, tells you what's possible. That's why we need more stories of women. That's why we need more stories of minorities. And when we don't tell stories of employee innovators, that comes at a major cost. I think at least three levels. At the individual level, what we have is we have a disengaged workforce. Somewhere between 80 and 90% of Americans are report being disengaged at work. When you're disengaged at work, that leads to depression, that leads to family, broken family relationships. At an organizational level, I can show you lots of statistics that show that companies that unlock employee-driven innovation, they grow faster, they're more profitable, they generate more shareholder value. That's how you win. So there are organizations that are losing out by not enabling employee-driven innovation. And at a societal level, I mean, think. What is the next internet going to be? The internet changed everything. We owe Google, we owe Facebook, and all that to the internet. Whatever the next internet is going to be is going to be created by an employee, 70% chance. And if that person isn't told the stories of how to do it and that they can do it, we're not going to get that. So it's a major cost to telling these wrong stories. The thing is that it's not always been this way. It hasn't always been that we have this narrative of that employees are not innovators and entrepreneurs are the innovators. Um, you can kind of think of it as there's a fortress and there's a shift. For every organization, you have a fortress, you've got to protect your walls, protect your core business, and then you have the ship. You have the adventurers going out and capturing new territory. And the idea is that the entrepreneurs are out there on the ships and the employees are in there. But it's not always been the way. You know, the, the, the pilgrims that settled the Americas, they were employees. And they weren't seeking avo the avoidance of, 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 of religious persecution. They actually lived in relatively, you know, a, a, a free society in Holland. And then the Virginia company hired them as employees to go and settle. In the 1960s, it was very common for employees to give, uh, for, for companies to give employees credit for the ideas they came up with. Like, you know, there would be people at Ford that I interviewed in the 1960s, and you'd get, if you came up with an idea and it saved money or it generated revenue, you'd get a portion of that. And there were many that I met that actually made more money from that than from their salary. Uh, in the 1960s, one example, this is Chuck House. I got to interview him. He was working on a project in HP at Hewlett Packard, and it was, he called it a large scale electrostatic display. He explained it to me as, an, as a TV connected to a computer, first time it had been done. And Mr. Packard, he makes his rounds to the research labs every year, and he went to the research lab and he saw this project and he didn't like this project at all. So he said, Chuck, I want you to kill this project. I mean, sorry, let me repeat that. Very important how he worded it. I want you, I don't want to see this project in the lab when I come back next year. And what he meant by that, of course, was I want you to kill the project. But how did Chuck d decide to interpret his statement? What's another way for it not to be in the lab next year? Bring it to the market. Bring it to market in less than 12 months. So what he does on his own time, on his own dime, over the holidays, he takes some of the prototypes and he flies them back home and he shows them potential, to potential clients. In January, when he comes back, he comes back with orders. Now, once there are orders, it's in the market, it's no longer in the R&D lab. It's because he made that choice that we saw Neil Armstrong land on the moon. Had he chosen to follow orders as they were intended, as opposed to doing what he knew was right for the company and for the world, we would have only heard Neil Armstrong say, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Now, did he get fired? No. This is what he won, the Medal of Defiance. I'll just read a couple of sentences from here. Awarded in recognition of extraordinary contempt and defiance beyond the normal call of engineering duty, in total defiance of adverse market studies and surveys concluding the existence of a worldwide market of no more than 50 total large-scale large electrostatic displays, Chuck House, using all means available, principally pen, tongue, and airplane, extolled an unrecognized technical contribution. So this is the way it used to be, and this is the way it can be. So I want to see, how can we start getting there? I said, I've interviewed 150 internal innovators, and I asked each one, what are the main barriers that you see 
to introducing an innovation inside an established company. And there were seven barriers that emerge with seven tools. And you know, being a consultant and wanting to put this into a framework that we can all remember and uh, hopefully apply, I forced it into a framework called Innovate, I-N-O-V-A-T-E. I'm not saying this is the truth. I believe all models are wrong. Some are useful. I'm just trying to make this useful for you. Intent is that many people have lost the intent to, to innovate. Uh, one of the former heads of the entrepreneurship program here at FIU, Alan Karstrud, he's a, a preeminent scholar in what is the intention that precedes entrepreneurial action. So if we don't have the intention to do something, we won't see the opportunity to do it. So that's the first one. Then comes need. Understanding what the market and organization need. 55% of mid-level managers can't name even two of their company's top strategic priorities. So sometimes a, a CEO will ask employees to innovate and then the pe people innovate in the wrong places because they don't understand where the company values innovation. Does that make sense? So we have to close that gap. Generating options. There's nothing more dangerous than an idea when it's the only idea you have. What we need to learn to do is create a continuous flow of ideas. Predicting and neutralizing value blockers. I really wanted to call this business models. How many members have heard the term business model? Just so I can get a sense. Okay. So business models uh, often create value blockers, which it means to say that you have a new idea, there's a natural business model around the idea, that business model conflicts with the existing business model of the company that you're working in, and that creates a bunch of reasons why you can't do it here. And so there's some clever ways to re-engineer the idea to remove those value blockers. ACT is about taking action on the idea. So many companies are going to ask you to prove it in order to let you do it. And with innovative ideas we could go into, you need to actually do the opposite. You need to do it in order to prove it, which creates a little bit of a dilemma. When this, that's where we're talking about agile experimentation. Team. Assembling a cross-functional agile team. Unless you're at the very top of the organization, the people that you need to work on your idea aren't going to all report to the same person because you need someone from marketing, you need something from operations, someone from IT, someone from sales, someone from distribution, and the only person that could order all of those people to work on your idea is very high up. So what you find is successful internal innovators do instead is they rally support around the idea so that people spontaneously want to jump on board and help advance the idea. And then environment. And this speaks to the organizational environmental barriers that suppress innovation. We could go into this leadership, talent, organizational structures and culture, and finding an island of freedom. Um, so these are the seven barriers. Again, if we had more time, we could go through all of them. Um, and all of them, I think, are exciting and inspiring, but I want to get a sense from you which ones you see as the most prevalent. So I'm going to pull up a little poll and I'm going to ask you to open up any device that you have that you can connect to the internet. And um, I'm going to give you a website. So if you look over here, I'm going to ask you to go to menti.com at the top, menti.com, punch in this code, 78, 75, 78, 59. It's right at the top, 75, 78, 79. You'll see these, uh, oh, I'm sorry, give me, sorry, give me one second. Give me one second. Sorry. Ah. Um, now, if you think about the organizations that you've worked in or that you work in, I'd like you to think about these seven barriers and say which ones uh, would you uh, strongly disagree with and which ones you strongly agree. So strongly would be mean, hey, this is not a problem here. I can get the resources. I can find the talent. Strongly disagree is this is a problem. You can just slide it left and right. I just want to get a sense of where collectively we are seeing the biggest barriers of the seven. And then you hit submit and the answers start popping up. Wait till like maybe 20 or 30 come up.
Okay, so what I'll do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about more about need and options and act. And then we'll go to Q&A and we can talk about other ones. Does that sound good? Awesome. Okay, so if we talk about need, Remember I said 55% of mid-level managers can't name even two of their company's top, top strategic priorities. So they ask us to innovate, but they don't tell us where to innovate. So we might come up with ideas that are great for the market, but not great for the company. And so you want to think of it as you as an internal innovator, you don't have one customer, you have two customers. So what you're looking for are ideas that the market needs. So there's a customer need. That's kind of where entrepreneurs you know, start. You're more likely to persevere pursuing that opportunity if it's also something that you care about. So what are you passionate about? What are you good at? What would you willing to commit yourself to? If you were an entrepreneur, you can operate in the overlap of this. But employee innovators, you have this other customer, which is what the company needs. And you know, if you were to bring a product to a customer and the customer rejects it, you wouldn't say there's something wrong with the customer. You say, well, let me learn from the customer and find out what their problems are with the solution so I can adjust the solution or I'm talking about the solution. And so what I see successful internal innovators doing is not blaming their company, which is a customer, for rejecting the idea, but instead saying, well, what's wrong with the idea that the company doesn't see the value in it? When these three things come together, then like magic happens. Um, Heather Davis is a client of mine, and she's now retired, so not a client of mine, became a good friend of mine. She worked at TIAA. She ran a fund that owned $25 billion in agricultural real estate. So the largest owner of agricultural real estate in the United States. They own more orchards and more soybeans, farms. And she recognized that there was a problem that the company had which is that because of a change in immigration law, they weren't able to hire the workers that they needed to work on the farms. Now the answer to a problem like that doesn't exist in your office. It exists out there, so she got out of her office, she flew to the west coast and she observed one of these orchards and she noticed that the kind of work that gets done on this farm, it's really tough work. You have to be strong, it's repetitive, there's not a lot of human contact. Now her son has autism. So that gave her the insight, you know, this is the perfect kind of work for people with autism. So here's a personal passion that meets a company need, and there's a market need for this, right, because the market needs these apples. And so she came up with an innovation, and she calls it Fruits of Employment. It's a program that helps people with autism find work on farms. Now, they don't just work on a farm. They get their first driver's license. They get something on their resume. They get their own money. They can pay their own rent. They start getting out of the house. It transforms their lives. It's something she's passionate about, something the company needs, something the market needs. Hundreds of people have gone through this program. So what we're looking for here is you see an opportunity. You want to make, ask those three questions. It's something I'm passionate about. It is something the market needs, but importantly, is it something that the company needs? Does that make sense? Let's talk a little about options now. We'll go to questions in a little bit. Options really comes from the, most of the work I've been doing up until now. So here's the problem with coming up with really interesting options is that if they are going to really be innovative in the world, is that they're going to make your competitors ignore and laugh at them. Um, this is Gandhi. He said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Now, what he's describing here is not a random list. He's describing an intentional strategic sequence. Who was his enemy? Who was his opponent? What was that? What was that? 
he was his own opponent. Okay. Who else? Who the, who, who's, who's, he, he was trying to get the British to leave. Does that make sense? Yep. The colonial, English, colonial Britain had occupied India. He wanted them out. And he said, if I do something that they're going to react quickly to, they're going to, you know, stop our movement. So instead, I'm going to do something that we'll first ignore, and then they'll laugh at. Because while they're ignoring and laughing at it, then we can be growing it. And by the time they wake up and say, wait a second, that's actually working, it's too late, you've already won. Today, we call this disruptive innovation as a permutation of this. You, do, you, you target a customer segment that your opponent doesn't care about, so they let you have them. And then you start attacking more valuable customer segments. Has anyone heard the term blue ocean strategy or blue ocean? It's another great strategic concept, which is you don't target customers which are represented by red oceans, where there's lots of competition, but by blue oceans, where there is no competition. Has anyone read The Art of War, Sun Tzu, The Art of War? I highly recommend that you read The Art of War, the original strategic text. Sun Tzu had a phrase called taking hold. You step in and your enemy just lets you take them whole. There's no bloodshed, there's no loss. This is one strategic concept. If you look at the underlying pattern, it's one strategic concept. It's been around for millennia. They just called it different things over the years, right? And so this pattern of doing something that others don't expect is the source of all competitive advantage. Here's just a fun example of, of one of these. <laughs> That. That's the, you do something that they don't expect. Uh, and this pattern is in all domains. The, before 1968, there were three ways to jump over high bars. You either did a scissor, or you did a straddle, or a roll, always forward. And then in 1968, in the, uh, in the Olympics in Mexico, Dick Fosbury Jeez, goes over Dick like this, this, and goes over backwards, right? He wins Dick the Olympics, Fosbury. it takes the competition, eight years to copy him, eight years later, 90% of high jumpers are doing what's now called the Fosbury flop. And so what I think these all point to is the fundamental aspect of innovation and the dilemma of innovation is that we need to get our organizations to do something that our competitors won't expect. Now they won't expect it because it's inconsistent with what's been done before. And if it's something that our, will make our competitors ignore and laugh, it's something that our colleagues and our bosses will ignore and laugh at as well. And so when we introduce an idea inside the organization, we're gonna find people who are gonna tell us that the idea is impossible. And that unfortunately is the only sign that it's a potentially a really great idea. Heavy air flying machines are impossible, as Lord Kelvin of the Royal Society said in 1895. Harry Warner said, who the hell wants to hear actors talk when someone proposed to him that they would release the first talking movie? Um, Ken Olson, a Digital Equipment Corporation CEO, he said, there's no reason for any individual to have a, a computer in their home. Uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner in physics said, there's no likelihood man can ever tap the power of an atom. Do you recognize this employee of HP? Who for five times proposed the, the technology that would become the Apple computer and five times was rejected by HP. Even the great innovator Thomas and Edison said, the phonograph is not of any commercial value. So what we want to get at is how do we overcome this? How do we overcome the fact that the disruptive idea will look different than what we've seen before? And the answer to doing that is actually quite simple, and uh, chess players can teach this to us. This is Alexandra Kostanuik. She's the reigning women's world chess champion. And what she'll do is she'll look at a, a chess board and immediately see the winning move. She'll line up a whole town, and she'll go from board to board to board. Each time, she'll look at the board and see the winning move. And then when she's done with her round, she's going to repeat. And she's going to win all of these games. And you could be sitting here, like this guy with the curly hair, for 20 minutes, staring at the board. What is she going to do? And you won't see it. And like that, she'll see it. Um, how does she do that? Well, actually, uh, the research into expertise and expert performance gives us a very clear answer, which is that she doesn't use logic. She uses patterns. And the reason that she sees options that we don't see is that she uses more and different patterns. So this is what my doctorate work has been in. And what I do is I look at companies and look at what patterns they use to describe their strategies. 
I think that there are 36 patterns. And so as I looked at these innovations, I asked, what are the patterns of thought that led to some of these great ideas of internal innovations? And so I'm just going to walk through a couple of them with you here, three of them. So as you're kind of activated your intent, you identify what your company needs, now the question is, how do I generate a solution to that? And one thing to look at is this pattern I call uh, move early to the next battleground, which is skate to where the puck is going to be, not where the puck is. And the reason that's important, particularly important today is that cycle times are shortening, that the future is getting to us more quickly. It used to be that you could introduce an innovation and wait 10 years before you introduce another innovation, but the, the future is already getting here as you are scaling up the innovation. You can see this across lots of trends. If we look at technological adoption curves, what we see is the telephone is the blue line on the left. Look how long it uh, took to reach 80 or 90 percent of U.S. household penetration. And then towards the right, we have things like um, smartphones, like social media. They're scaling much more quickly. And what that means is the kind of thinking that will give you the idea, it used to be long-term thinking, but now that long-term thinking has immediate payoff. I got a chance to interview Elon Musk and uh, soon after he launched SpaceX, and I asked him, what happened? You sold PayPal, you netted $150 million for yourself, and you decided to invest all of that in building rocket ships. Why'd you do that? And he just said, well, I think a future in which anyone can shoot stuff into space is more exciting than one in which only the government can. That sounds like a risky premise. Like, if you brought that to your boss, like, what would they say, right? But what he said was, look, if we step into the future, what we know is that humans are going to be an interplanetary species. What's stopping us from getting there is that it costs too much to build and launch, launch a rocket ship. The government is going to have to privatize that part of the space program in order to drive down the cost of launching vehicles into space, and I'm going to build a company that's perfectly tailored to take that off their hands. This is the kind of thing that used to take a long time to wait for, and now it's going to come much more quickly. And probably your company isn't a, doesn't appreciate how quickly the future is going to get here. This is pill pack. It was invented by a pharmacist, second generation, and he noticed that people with multiple prescriptions sort of had a difficult time. They would have to take multiple trips to the pharmacy. They would have to uh, deal with multiple bottles. They got confused. And he said, you know what it should work in the future is you're going to get all of your pills delivered to your house. They're going to come in a roll of little packets, and at the top you can see over here this little packet says 8 a.m. Monday, and just the pills that you take at 8 a.m. Monday. So he goes through the process to get regulatory approval in, 80, in 48 states, and he builds this future, and last year sells it to Amazon for a billion dollars. Six years, a billion dollars in, 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 in value creation. Just by that simple thinking about where is the next battleground. So if you only have time and you go to work in your organizations to think about one thing. The most important thing is where is the next battleground in terms of customer needs and pain points, technologies, regulatory changes, industry norms, where is the next battleground and what can we do to move there early? That make sense? I'm going to show you one more and then we're going to go into, uh, we're going to go into uh, Q&A. Um, another one to really think about is, I call it be good. Um, I see many of the innovations that are successful coming out of established companies coming from this frame of mind. It used to be believed that corporations existed to do one thing, to maximize shareholder value. Um, but increasingly, companies are realizing that if you only focus on shareholders, you create resistance for your growth. And then that diminishes shareholder value. Um, a better strategy is one where your growth is good for all stakeholders. And so if we take that perspective and ask, how can we create strategic power by being good, then that opens up interesting possibilities. My wife, as I mentioned, she's a general counsel at a MasterCard, and she's more engaged at work than she's been in the last 10 years to a great extent because their CEO, Ajay Banga, has aligned the company behind the idea that it is a force for good. What he says is, we're driving for a world beyond cash, where everyone's using electronic payments, no one's using cash. 90% of transactions today worldwide are still cash. And that's good for business, but by the way, that's also good for the world, right? Because if a drug dealer sells drugs to your child in a world beyond cash, that becomes traceable. You can find out who that is. A world beyond cash creates transparency, accountability. It's a better world. You see, we're not a, a social enterprise. We're a for-profit enterprise, but by the way, our growth is good for the world. If you start taking that perspective, 
entirely new ways of solving problems become available. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is stockpiles. Anyone heard of stockpile by any chance? No, stockpile. So stockpile, so um, I'm a first generation, my wife's first generation, our parents didn't transfer a very, you know, you know, great financial literacy to us. And we want to make sure that ends with us. So we want to make sure our kids like really understand finances. So what I do is I buy them gift certificates of stockpiles. So it's a company that sells stock, but they sell it to children. And they sell it in gift cards. And you don't just buy stock, you buy incremental shares. So I gave $50 to my son, and he decided to invest all of that in um, Berkshire Hathaway. Anyone know how much Berkshire Hathaway stock costs? About $250,000 a share. He owns $50, so it's an incremental share. Uh, I have another friend who tried to take Berkshire Hathaway stock and sell incremental shares, and Berkshire Hathaway sued them very quickly and stopped that. But they let Stockpile do it because Stockpile is doing it for good. And so now my kids have these amazing conversations about money and stocks. And um, it's just a beautiful thing to watch. I'm going to show you a little recording of my, my daughter, just a little teeny piece, just to see, like, Here's a 12-year-old. Amazon thing went up 91.67% higher. Wow. For how long? Uh, I don't know. For, and I got $9.17 more. Nice. Yeah. You made $9.17 without doing anything. Yeah. Isn't that nice to make money without doing mm -hmm. anything? But look at how it goes. Wow. Why did you invest in Amazon? Because I like Amazon. Because I get... I get Toys. No, here comes the investment movies. genius coming up. Prime there. See so if you're getting Buffett. Yeah. Plus, they bought Whole Foods. Oh, good. And I had it before they bought Whole Foods, so it went like. <laughs> 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 so there's a 12 year old that's thinking about Amazon buying Whole Foods and what that can do to a stock, and I think that's a beautiful thing, right? So as you look for problems to solve in the world that your co company cares about, these are this is one thing you can ask: is um, how can we create strategic power by doing good? So we covered, um, sorry, we covered two of the barriers, and um, I just want to like open up the 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 Q and A then for a little while, and just and we can I can jump around and, and pull up other slides um, as they are relevant to you because I just want to make sure you walk out of here with what's most valuable to you. Also, I'm happy to find a way to get this presentation to you as well. Um, so intent, need, options, value blockers, team, uh, act, team, and environment. Any questions or comments?